And I might mention he's got a, a, a tons of, of books back there that is just excellent reading. Uh, I consider him one of the great defenders of the King James Bible today. And uh, Thank you. oh, you've got enough books up there. You you brought them with you. Yeah, I hope I I'll hold those. Yeah, for an hour or two. Let me. Just, here, just, just hold them. Yeah. Until all I right. All right. Them we'll do them one one at a time here. here. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Some folks, you just have to explain everything to. <laughs> I remember this one. This is Ned and the First Reader. I remember that one. Yes. No, I'm kidding. All right. Now you. Lights on red, you hit the button, it should turn to green, and say penny there to Sky we, King and see if you're on. There we are. All right. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. And you folks were telling me he's not helpful or useful at all. Yeah. Like you're completely all wrong. Right. He was a big help. Thank you, my God friend. Right. I appreciate your pastor so very much. You got water there next Your to church, you. I appreciate the invitation to be here. When you have a ministry like mine, I've been busy as a preacher for over 40 years, which I started when I was four, I want you to understand that. But I've been busy as a preacher over 40 years. I am not pastoring now. I have the title, uh, the Vice President of the Day Spring Bible College, Ministry of the Clinton Road Baptist Church up in Lake Zurich, Illinois. It's mostly an honorary title. They're, they're just trying to be a, a blessing and encouragement because I have a long history working in Bible colleges. I'm in full-time evangelism now. My life is dependent on pastors. This is what I've been called to, but I only get the chance to do it when pastors invite me. By the grace of God, I've had an invitation for every week in the almost two years that I've been doing this. It is how I earn my living, and it's also what I do for fun, and, and uh, but seriously. And, and so I'm dependent on pastors for all those things, and I'm so grateful, Pastor, for you giving me the opportunity to come and be here, be at your church. Just very quickly, I have a table with books back there. The goal of my writing, like the goal of my preaching, is to make the complicated simple. And uh, there's some things that I just think our people desperately need to know. Let me mention the two books I did not have when I was here a year and a half ago. This is called The Transformation, America's Journey to Darkness. It traces what happened to the United States that took it from being a Christian nation to being the pagan nation that it is today. So how, how could you call the United States pagan? Over a million abortions every year? Government laws and regulations that promote homosexuality and transgenderism. I mean, you want me to go on? Y'all get the idea where we are? And uh, that was written in the 1990s. It's been updated by a friend of mine, and so we have it back in print. It was not here when I was here before. And then this is a new book I wrote with my pastor, co-wrote, 16 chapters. We each wrote eight. It's called Evangelism Made Simple. And it's one of those things. You know how pastors are? I remember from being a pastor what we're like. He calls me in one day and says, Phil, we've got our big conference coming up in six weeks. And he says, I, I want to have this book for the conference. And he said, I'm not going to get done. And uh, could you help me finish? I said, well, how, how much you got left to do? And he said, just eight of the 16 chapters. <laughs> and and uh, he said, you don't have to. And then so I said, that's, that just doesn't make sense to do that and I got to thinking about it said you know when I was young and people challenged me to do crazy things I always did it just just because the challenge was exciting I said I guess if my pastor is going to give me that kind of trouble I said I'll have my part done and I did uh, it's called evangelism made simple we hear people all the time say I'd like to be saved but I just can't do all that they don't understand what salvation is we'll sure be a lot more effective soul winners if we can show people what it means genuinely from the Bible to be saved. And we'll talk about that some in the message. Those are brand new. I've got some history books back there. Man, I wish our people understood our history. This is what I'm probably most famous for, Faithful Baptist Witness. And it's the story of our Baptist heritage, Baptist doctrine and history of the people that have held it for the last 2,000 years. It's written to be simple. It's written for the average person sitting in the pew. There's a lot of great, great Baptist history books that are written for theologians but, but I had the idea most of our people weren't reading them. And um, th this explains our Baptist heritage. We're losing our young people right and left Amen. to churches that are not sound doctrinally because they do not understand how important the doctrine is. And uh, that's designed to address that. Your pat pastor mentioned the world history books. This is, they're not textbooks. They're designed to tell world history from a Christian perspective. 
and oh, we need that so desperately in the day and age in which we live. For example, there's in, there are in here chapters on Islam. We don't know a thing about Islam in our country, and we're paying for that right and left. Uh, about socialism, what ha what's happening in Venezuela right now should not be surprised. It's what always happens when a nation goes socialistic, sometimes quicker than others, but uh, so forth. I wish our people knew that. These two are United States history. And again, all you had to do was pay attention during the election and all the time following it. Our people don't have a clue about United States history, what it is, what's gone on, what's made the United States the nation that it is. We, we need this. And again, we have a table full of that and some smaller books as well. And uh, I'll, uh, yeah, we, the prices are back there. What we have done recently that seems to be popular with folks, we've just all of them together for $120. And that's in effect, that's the amount you'd pay for the bigger books. It means getting all the small books for free. But if you're interested about, feel free to ask me any questions. If there's one question I tell people I don't ask, I don't answer. And if I don't tell you, somebody will ask me. People come up and say, which one do you recommend? I either wrote or co-wrote all of them. Which ones do you think I recommend? Okay. Bless your hearts. If, would you go to Isaiah chapter 53 with me? And appreciate your pastor and this church. Appreciate your prayers, testimony of the church, and what God's doing here. And I, I just consider it a gracious privilege to have the chance to be here. The Lord's blessed us with uh, meetings every week. And, um, and I've been doing this now since the first week of December in 2015. Had a meeting every week. It's just been amazing how gracious the Lord has been. And ha the variety of places I've got to preach. Four weeks ago, I was in jungle in Togo, Africa. It was an amazing experience. No electricity. The uh, thatched grass walls with a tin roof. And uh, they had a little generator that would power three light bulbs. That's all it would power. It was all it was strong enough for. And I got there, and I couldn't see anything. I said, you know, I think I need to use a message that I got memorized <laughs> in this service. But it was just a tremendous thing. We had 15 folks saved in that meeting. We're, we're talking to make arrangements to go back next year and be able to spend some more time in churches like that. My pastor and I went together. We spent some time in, in uh, churches in the cities. And, uh, but man, I'll tell you what, you get some moments like that. They are special ones. We're in Isaiah chapter 53, if you'd bear with me. I want us to take a look at this. I realize the Jewish people say this is a chapter about the nation of Israel and what the nation of Israel suffered. But as we go through this, you'll see every reference is a personal pronoun and not a single reference to the nation of Israel. This is about a person and what that person would suffer. This is about what was done for us. When I pastored in Chicago, we had a big Ethiopian department in our church and, and we had a little five-year-old Ethiopian boy trusted Christ as his savior. And uh, in one of their services, mom and dad were a little worried about him being too young to be saved. Let me promise you, I do not worry about that at all. It's easier for children to get saved than it is adults. Adults have to become like little children to get saved, not the other way around. See, salvation's a gift. And you know what happens when you offer an adult a gift? I said, well, what do I have to give back to be even? You know what happens when you offer a child a gift? They take it. It's that said and done. Children get saved easier than adults do and more often than adults do. So I wasn't concerned, but mom and dad were, so I agreed to talk with him. And he came in to see me, and uh, a little fellow named Boaz. And I said, Boaz, I heard you got saved. He said, that's right, Pastor. I said, can you tell me what being saved means? He said, it means Jesus died for my sins, and I forget all the other stuff. <laughs> but that is the issue. Jesus Christ died for my sins. And when you get that, oh, put it in its place. You got it all. Let's look at the, all this together. Isaiah chapter 53. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there's no beauty we should desire him. Verse 1 and 2 tells us who it is we're talking about. We're talking about the one that was virgin born. There was no natural, regener no natural generation to his birth. He's a root out of a dry ground. 
Now, there's only one person in the history of the world that qualifies that or could be the subject that's in front of us. That's the Lord Jesus. Now, there's a fancy theological term for the doctrine we're about to look at. Here's the fancy theological term. It's called the substitutionary atonement. Boy, if you get this chapter, you can tell everybody you know a fancy theological term. And if you can get one word, you got that term, you got this chapter. It's the word for. Not the number. The preposition. Christ died for you. I, I was preaching this in the Philippines and last January and a bunch of children in a service in a big church there and uh, I told them, said, if you get one word, you can go home, tell your parents you know all about the substitutionary atonement and you'll know just as much about this doctrine as any adult here if you can get this one word. The one word is for. Christ died for you. On the way out, they all came up past me and said, four, four, just a line of them, a troop of four, four. A couple weeks later, I was preaching out in Cambodia, and I was preaching out in the jungle, and I was actually preaching. Cambodia is basically a Buddhist country, but there's a corner that's Muslim, and I was in a Muslim corner there. I'll say more about that in a minute, but it was an amazing meeting. We were in the Muslim corner of a Buddhist country. They told me we're going to have a 10 o'clock in the afternoon, evangelist, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, rather, evangelistic meeting. So who goes to an evangelistic meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning? I was thinking American. New town has sort of been carved out of the jungle recently. I'm the second American ever to preach there. And I went there, and the public schools, there's not one place in America this could happen. The public schools sent all their fourth, fifth, and sixth graders to the evangelistic meeting. 230 of them. They sent four adults with them. And four adults was enough to keep them behaved. I don't think there's anywhere in America you would send any 230 junior age kids with four adults. They'd be overwhelmed. But I told that story to them. That just happened a couple weeks before, and I told that story to them. And, and, and they, they had to be translated, but I explained it to them and translated it. And on the way out, the Cambodian kids were coming up to me, four, four, four. So if you understand that word, you can get this whole doctrine. I was repeating that story just a few weeks ago, literally in the jungle in Togo, Africa, as I was telling you about. I was repeating that story. It's being translated into French, which is their main language there. And, and on the, when the service was over, uh, little kids were coming up to me saying, four, four, four. Did y'all got it? I mean, this is the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement. Christ died for us. That's the subject of Isaiah chapter 53. Christ died for us. If you'll pick up with me in verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. What is the most famous, well-known thing about the Lord Jesus Christ? He's the Son of God. There's so many things you could say. But the fact is... Christ died for us. Verse 5. But he was wounded. This is not about a nation. This is about a Savior. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. I mean, Christ died for us. I may have said this a year and a half ago, but if you'll forgive me for repeating it right here, I came from sort of a, a rough background in inner city Indianapolis, and my father uh, had uh, never been inside a church. He was 48 when I was born. When I was 10, he was 58. He was proud of the fact he'd never been inside a church building his entire life. Not only had he never attended a church service, he thought all Christians were phonies and hypocrites, he wouldn't go to a wedding or a funeral if it was in a church building. He'd literally never been in the doors of a church. I was 10. I was extremely curious then. I'm extremely curious now. I've been to all kinds of religious services just to see what they were like. I even went to a black Muslim meeting one time. They announced in Indianapolis they're having a public meeting 
to explain how all white people were created by the devil. I figured I needed to know, so I went, and um, there are about 200 people there, and, and um, I, I was the only one there who ever needed to work on my suntan. We'll just put it that way. And um, they, 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 guys, they said the devil created white people on another planet. He created them solely for the purpose of hurting God's people, black people, and that we didn't even know we were doing it, but we were always conspiring against the black race because it was genetic in us, having been created by the devil. And then after he'd created us on the other planet, the devil brought us here. And I mean, he's explaining all this and giving illustrations and all that kind of thing. And every now and then he'd talk about what every white person was like. And folks would turn and look at me. i just sit there and smile. It was interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I just gone to all kinds of religious services. I don't know if you ever heard of the Rastafarians. It's a Caribbean cult. I was down in the Bahamas. I went to a Rastafarian service. It took a preacher friend of mine with me. He still shakes his head talking about that. It's Humberto Gomez, his nephew, by the way, he still tells that story. He said, you wouldn't believe where Brother Stringer made me go. But I was curious at 10. we driven by all kinds of church buildings. I did not know what a church was, and I did not know what happened in a church, and I was curious. So a lady came by trying to build a bus route, asked if I'd like to ride the church bus to church. I said, yes, riding a church bus, that sounded like fun. Going somewhere I'd never been, that sounded like fun. I'd said yes, and she'd signed me up before my dad knew about it. I went to church. He didn't like the idea, but he didn't forbid me. I went to church, and man, oh man, I figured out those folks have got something I don't have. I didn't know what it was. I didn't have a clue how to behave. Church was in two sections, and I, I, I sat in the front row right there. And I found out they had church on Sunday night and Thursday nights, and I, I started going to church Sunday night and Thursday night too, and I would come in every service, and I would sit right in that front corner. I was amazed. I knew when you went to the circus, you paid more for front seat. If you went to the movies, you went early so you could get the front seats. Went to a ball game, you paid more for front seats. But I could go to church, and I always got the front seat free. <laughs> I, I still sit in the front seat, even when people hassle me about it from the pulpit. But nonetheless, that's I, I, still my norm. And um, uh, after a few weeks, I figured out what they were talking about, and I trusted Christ as my Savior. And... I kept going. I was a 10-year-old boy. I was hyperactive. I had been hyperactive by nature. I said one time when I was preaching that if they'd had Ritalin when I was a kid, I'd have got put on Ritalin. And after the service, my wife said, I'd still like to put you on Ritalin. <laughs> I started on my dad about coming to church. He said, no way. He said, I've, I've gotten this far without ever being in church. I'm never... Christians are phony and Christians are this and that and the other. But I kept on him and kept bothering him and kept bothering him. Finally, he said, I'll come to church one time if you promise never to bother me again. Y'all forgive me, I was 10. I promised. He came to church and I didn't stop bothering him. When he came to church, I said, Christians just go to church to show off their new clothes. He came into church. He was sitting there. Man came in, recognized him as a visitor, went and sat with him, talked to him before Sunday school. That man always wore blue jean overhauls and a flannel shirt. Sometimes a red flannel shirt, sometimes a blue flannel shirt. But that's what he wore every Sunday. He saw my dad sitting there. He sat and talked with him. He sat with him through Sunday school. Then he talked to him in a break between Sunday school and church, sat with him through church and talked to him afterwards, gave him his phone number and was friendly to him, said, let's get together, our families together sometime. And in a morning, he didn't know my dad or anything about the situation, but he destroyed everything my father had ever said about church. A few weeks later, my father got the sad news. He had a disease. It was a fatal disease. He only had a few weeks to live. He came home, broke the, the news to my mom. The three of us were sitting in the living room crying. And finally, my dad said to my mom, said, would you call the boys preacher? She called him. By the grace of God, he only lived four blocks away. He was there in five minutes. They gave him the news. And he looked at my father and said, could I show you from the Bible how a person can know they're going to heaven when they die? And my father said, yes. And the preacher sat right next to my father, and I sat right next to the preacher, was in on the whole conversation. Preacher showed him 
John 3, 16, four verses in the book of Romans, and Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And my father looked at him and said, Preacher, you don't know what I have done. He would led a pretty rough life. And a preacher said, Bob, that's not the problem. The problem is you don't know what he has done. He said, if you knew what he had done, you understand the issue is not what you have done. And he started again, John 3, 16, four verses in Romans, Ephesians 2, to this day, all these years later, when I'm witnessing somebody, it's John 3, 16, four verses in Romans, and Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that just got implanted on my heart and mind. And when he went through it the second time, my father trusted Christ as his Savior. When he realized the issue was that Christ had died for him. Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Sheep are amazing animals. You've got to have them watched all the time. You know what happens if you leave a bunch of sheep alone? They wander. You don't watch the cattle 24 hours a day. You don't watch the hogs 24 hours a day, but you better watch the sheep 24 hours a day. We're compared to sheep. Verse 7, he is impressed and he was afflicted. He opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. Since I've been preaching this several times, I've come across people that, that are, have sheep. In one case, a fellow that was a butcher, and they'd say, boy, dealing with sheep's totally different. Boy, you don't butcher a cow in front of another cow because it'll get the idea. You don't butcher a hog in front of another hog because it'll fight like crazy. But sheep don't know what's going on. If you butcher one sheep right in front of another sheep, it won't have a clue what's going on. And they don't fight back. Christ went to the cross like a lamb led to the slaughter and did not fight or resist. He went because his purpose was that he could die for us. Did y'all get it? For. He was taken from prison, verse 8, and from judgment, who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. Was he stricken? Christ died for us. Man, oh man, I can't tell you how many people there are I honestly believe that have never gotten saved because they do not know this. They do not get this. For all they've heard about Christianity and all they've heard about Christ, they've missed this simple truth. Christ died for them. They think Christianity is a way of living <clears throat> just to please God. You heard about it in Sunday school. They think Christianity is a way of living in order to get God to accept you. God accepts us based on what Jesus Christ did for us. I was preaching in Cambodia. I mentioned it to you where all the children were at. They weren't the only ones who were there. You ever hear about Pol Pot? Pol Pot was the communist dictator in Cambodia. He took over the country and in five years had executed a third of the population, three of nine million. Just as wicked a man as ever walked the face of the earth. They tried to overthrow him. There was a 10-year civil war, and by the time that 10-year civil war was over, his army had been pushed into this corner of Cambodia, into this jungle. And, and the army made a deal, uh, or his army made a deal with the folks who were fighting him, said, we, you leave us alone, don't come after us, you don't try to prosecute us for what happened during the killing fields time. He says, we'll stay here and not bother anybody, and that's what they've done. They still have armed camps out there in that corner of the country, but th there's no fighting going on. We went to the killing fields when I was there, saw one of them. It's where they buried thousands and thousands of people. They, they dig a hole with a bulldozer, have the people stand in the hole and shoot them. Cover them up, and then dig another hole, bring more people in. And they, they've discovered over 300 of them. And today, all these years later, the bodies and pieces of bodies are working their way up through the weather to the surface. And one of the first things they'd tell you, showed you, when we went to that killing field, they have 25,000 skulls that have come out of that field. They're not done. And they'd tell you, if you see bones as you're walking around the tour, leave them there. They said every Sunday morning, the staff comes around and picks up human bones. So we're taking a break. The preacher's with me and sat on a bench. And, and look, there was an arm bone sticking up out of the ground right in front of the bench where we were sitting. It was a horrible, horrible experience. They have a museum they call the Genocide Museum because they took careful photographs of everything they did. 
and, and the, the Genocide Museum has 36 rooms full of photographs. And they say nobody's ever got through the whole thing. I went through the first 12 and then the number 36, I couldn't take it anymore. But some of Paul Pot's soldiers came to that meeting. And we knew because the preacher translating for me was son of a medical doctor. Paul Pot had kidnapped that medical doctor. He spared his family. The medical doctor traveled with him to keep him in the top leadership in good physical health. And he'd let him see his family two hours a week just so he'd know they were still alive and know that as long as he did his job, they'd stay alive. Well, my translator was a boy from that family, and he recognized some of the guys that were there. And he told me before we started, that's one of Paul Pot's officers, and that's one of Paul Pot's officers, and that's one of Paul Pot's officers. I preached this same message there. We gave an invitation, had over a hundred of the kids that came trust Christ as their Savior. And over 25 of the adults, including some of Paul Potts' officers, trust Christ as their Savior. You see, there isn't anybody anywhere that you can't talk to and you cannot tell them that Jesus Christ died for them. He died for everyone. Now, I got it. It's a substitutionary atonement of Christ. Christ took mankind's sin upon himself to make salvation possible for everybody. Verse 9, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him when he hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Oh, what a statement. Christ was an offering for my sin. He didn't give an offering he was an offering for my sin. What a story it is. And it's a story for everybody you'd ever want to come across. My first pastorate, I, uh, we had an abortion clinic near us. And the lady that owned the abortion clinic was in the news all the time complaining about protesters. And, and she said some rough things about them. And she just kept popping it up in my sermons even when I didn't plan it. You know how it is, Brother Holt. Things are on your mind. They just show up. And frankly, she was easy preaching and and I, she just got mentioned a lot in my sermons. One day, one of the ladies of the church came in and said, By the way, Pastor, she's my next door neighbor. <clears throat> and every time you mention her, I go home and tell her about it. And she wants to meet you. I thought, Man, this is going to be one fun conversation. I gave her a time, I memorized verses deal with the abortion issue I memorize statistics I'm ready for the mother of all debates about abortion I mean I am ready to have that argument that fight that debate she shows up on time secretary lets her in the office she sits down in front of me and I'm ready to go and she puts her head in her hands and starts to cry I was stunned I didn't know what to do I'm old school I fall apart when females cry I can be tough unless there's females with tears coming out in front of me and I don't, finally I said, ma'am, is there something I can do for you? And she looked at me. She said, I'd like to be saved. But she said, God would never have me because there's too much blood in my hands. I said, ma'am, have I got good news for you? When Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, he paid for all of your sins. She got saved, closed the abortion clinic, and I baptized her the next Sunday. And you should have seen the look on our people's faces when I gave the name of the lady I was baptizing. <laughs> I'm just telling you, you're not going to deal with anybody and somebody Christ died for. I can tell you that story over and over and over and over again. Christ died for everybody. Same church. Uh, when I first went there, we had about 20 people in the church in a 400-seat auditorium. I mean, everybody stood out. If one person was missing, it's obvious. And there's a young blonde lady, found out later she was 21, and she would come in after the service got started, and she'd leave at the start of the invitation. I hadn't met her, even though she'd been there every Sunday I'd been pastor. I'd never met her. And, and uh, she looked like she's under conviction when I was preaching. Some people are stone-faced. You can't tell what they're thinking. But there's other folks, I could just look at them, and you know what's going on. And so I asked one of the ladies about her, and they said, Pastor, you need to leave that alone. And I said, no, I have to talk to her. She seems under conviction about salvation, and I'm the pastor. I got to talk to her. And I said, you understand? I said, she's the new trophy wife of a mafia hitman who's three times her age. He's in his 60s. And he is so jealous, she is not allowed to speak to another male. 
and he asks her every day if she's spoken to a male. And the reason she comes late and leaves early is so she doesn't speak to anybody. And when he asks her, have you spoken to another male? She can say no. I dug up an address. It was way out in the country. I went out to find, in fact, I got lost trying to find him. I stopped somewhere, asked for directions. They said, you won't go back there. I went and knocked on the door. Big man, angry looking man, opened the door. Who are you? I'm the pastor from the church down the road. I said, your wife's been attending some of our services, and I've never met her, I've never had a chance to talk to her. But, but I thought I ought to come by and, and see if she's open to talking about the Lord. And if it's all right, I'd like to talk to you about the Lord too. You know who I am? I said, sir, I've heard stories. I said, right now as I'm standing nose to nose with you, I'm hoping they're not true. <laughs> he laughed. He said, ah, come on in. I went in, sat down. I went through the gospel with him and her. And with him sitting there approving, she trusted Christ as her Savior. He looked at her and said, you can go to that church anytime you want to. No restrictions. By the way, it's when it's the only place you're allowed to go, you become a faithful member real quick. She came Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, church activities, every service or revival meeting. And every once in a while, he'd even come to a service with her. Pretty soon, they had a little baby girl born. I was at the hospital in a waiting room with him and his mafia buddies while we were waiting for the baby to be born. They didn't take to me like he did. It was just an uncomfortable situation. A year later, they had another little baby girl born, and again, I was there with his buddies in the waiting room. One day, secretary called me, and I was out making visits. She called. She said, Pastor, I don't know how to say this, but she said, there's some mafia guys here at the church looking for you, and they insist on talking to you right away. I said, well, I, I guess it's okay. We're kind of friends. Uh, know each other and and so I said tell them where I'm at and they came they said look Fritz had a heart attack he's in a hospital they say he's got to have surgery immediately if he's going to survive but he's got two of the guys there told him said don't you let anybody cut on me till Pastor Stringer gets here I said okay I'll meet you at the hospital they said no you understand he ordered us to get you one of our guys will drive your car home we're taking you So they drove me to the hospital. I went into cardiac care unit. He looked at me as I walked in, and his first words were, did you mean it? I said, mean what? He said, you said Christ died for me, that he'd save even me. Did you mean it? I said, well, I meant it, but that's not the important part of this story. The important part of this story is that Christ meant it. And I showed him again. John 3.16 and four verses from the book of Romans and Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And there with medical people there, with his buddies there, with family members there, he trusted Christ as his Savior. A few weeks later, I baptized him. So he, he left his profession. I sure hope so. I didn't ask tons of questions. I know this. He made a good church member. He did not like it when people disagreed with the pastor. And he had a way of expressing himself. We had a bit of trouble with some folks, and he called me, literally called me one night, and said, do you want something done about them? <laughs> and I think he meant, do you want me to scare them? That, that's how I chose to interpret that. And, and pastor, you'll have to forgive me, I lied to him. I said, no, I don't. <laughs> that wasn't my first thought. <laughs> but, but you understand, I could look at him, and tell him that Jesus Christ died for him. Did y'all get it? For. Christ died for you. He died for your family members. He died for your relatives. He died for the people you go to school with. He died for the people you work with. He died for your neighbors. He died for the people that you meet along the course of life. Christ died for you. I was preaching in the Philippines, and they have this thing called Evangelistic Sunday. They'll, they'll take a Sunday and pray all year and tell their body to do everything you can possibly do to get lost people that Sunday. That Sunday's for folks to get saved. And I was preaching at Evangelistic Sunday, and they had along the front row, they had people sitting there, and they were going to have them give their testimony. They're all people who've been saved during the last year. 
They're going to get up and tell about being saved. There's a 16-year-old Filipino girl there. She would gotten saved. A big church, a couple thousand people, and she'd never spoken in public before, and she was scared to death. And she had all written out what she wanted to say. And the theme of her testimony was precious, that salvation is precious, and she got her mom and dad there to hear her speak. And she wanted more than anything in the world for her mom and dad to get saved. She got up and started to read that and talk about how precious salvation is, and she broke up crying and couldn't finish. Sat down. They had a couple more testimonies. They put her up there again. She started reading it again from the beginning, and this time she got farther, but she still didn't get to the end. She broke down crying. Sat down. They got a couple more people up there. They brought her up a third time. She started reading it again, and she got farther this time, but still didn't get to the end. She broke up crying. She sat down. This time, she happened to be sitting next to me when she sat down, and she was crying and bawling. And she said, I ruined everything. She said, my mom and dad are here. She said, I want them to get saved, and I ruined everything. I looked at her and said, young lady, you have no idea. Everybody here, including your mom and dad, gets it. This is precious to you. She said, that's probably as eloquent a testimony about salvation as I've ever heard from anybody. I said, don't you worry about your mom and dad. I preached for about 20 minutes, not something I do often, by the way. But I preached for about 20 minutes because you could tell they were ready for an invitation. 311 people came to get saved, including her mom and dad. And in the grace of God, there wasn't room at the altar to deal with them all, so they're dealing with them along the front row, and she's sitting on the front row, and her mom and dad happened to be right in front of her when somebody pointed their, them to Christ. You can just say this to anybody. Jesus Christ died for you. I was preaching on in, in April in Maryland, and, and uh, they said, we have a man here, he's been coming forward every, every invitation for the last seven weeks, but he can't seem to grasp it. I get it. And uh, he came forward and said, could I talk to the preacher? And they got me down from the pulpit, and, and I'm talking to him, and he said, I just don't get it. He said, how could it be that Christ died for me? How can somebody pay for somebody else's sin? How is that possible? How could that be? He said, I'm trying, but I just can't get it. I said, listen, I understand. I said, you want to know a secret? He said, it doesn't make sense to me either that somebody else paid for my salvation. My, my mind doesn't grasp it, but my heart rejoices in the fact that God told me this is the way it is. And so I believe it because God said so. He looked at me and said, I believe. Trusted Christ as his Savior. Came back service that night and a lady came in. And she said, this was the first time I was ever at this church was this morning. And said, I, she pointed at me and said, I heard the gentleman preach. And she said, I've been thinking about it all afternoon. She said, is that really true? That I could be saved? She got saved for the start of the service. Hanging around with everybody in the auditorium. Sitting in the front of the pews. You can say this to anyone. A couple years ago, I was in the Philippines, and I was preaching in a church. I was getting ready to leave in the morning, fly to Japan, and there was a lady that was there in the service for the very first time she'd ever been at church. Her father got saved six weeks previously, and they'd been Catholic like most folks in the Philippines. And He had said, oh, you've got to come to church tonight and hear this American preacher. And so the preacher, in introducing me, mentioned I was flying to Japan the next day. This lady came up to me afterwards, and she said, um, may I ask what airline you're flying? I told her. She said, I work for that airline. She said, I'm in charge of all the flights to Japan. She said, would you mind coming by my office in the morning? I went by her office, and she checked and found out there was an opening in first class, and she got me a free upgrade to first class. And then she said, may I ask you a question? I feel in a pretty good mood. I said, sure. And she said, this getting saved business, is this just for Baptists, or can a Catholic lady get saved too? John 3.16, yeah. four verses out of the book of Romans in Ephesians 2.8.9, she trusted Christ as her Savior. I was there the next year, and I wondered, you know, sometimes you see people make professions, you never hear a word about them again. I, wondered, I went to that church, preached at church, I went there, and I got there, and she was leading choir practice. She'd showed up at church the next Sunday, told them she got saved, and they discovered she had musical as well as administrative ability, and they'd put her to work. I'm just telling you, this is for everybody. 
pastoring in Chicago. Young lady graduated from the University of Michigan. She moved two blocks from our church. She walks into church. My wife and I talk to her. We're visiting with her. And she said, I have a question. She said, I hope you can help me. It's really been bothering me. She said, what works is it you have to do to be saved? To be honest with you, that's most people's question, whether or not they admit it or not. And she said, I grew up Catholic, and they told me what works I had to do when I was a little girl. But she said, in high school, my friends were Pentecostals, and I started going to their church around with them, and they told me what works to do. But it was different than what the Catholics said. She said, at the University of Michigan, my dorm was right across the street from a Buddhist assembly. And so I started going to the Buddhist assembly every week, and they told me what works to do. But what they told me didn't match the Pentecostals or the Catholics. Can you tell me what works do I have to do to go to heaven? I looked at her and said, no. She said, you mean you're a preacher and you don't know? I said, that's not the problem. The problem is works don't take you to heaven. And I tried to, my wife and I tried to explain it to her. She just, she'd been so confused, she just couldn't get it. We talked to her several times, and she was really troubled. And she said, look, my boyfriend's coming down from Michigan. He's going to be here for church next Sunday. Could we just agree we're going to talk about this until I can finally understand? I said, you got it. Sunday morning service. Boyfriend was there. We went into my office. We're sitting there talking. We talked for an hour. Boyfriend got saved. He's trying to help me explain it to her, and she still can't get it. We talked for another hour. I've run out of things to say. I've used every illustration I can think of. I've gone to verse after verse after verse, and she still hasn't got it. People have told me this sounds wise, but it wasn't wise. I'm desperately stalling for time because I fi can't figure out what to say. I took her to that classic hymn, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. I asked if she'd repeat the line for me a few times that's in that. It is enough that Jesus died. And that he died for me. And Jesus started repeating it like I asked. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. On the fifth time, she said, it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. And on the sixth time, at the top of her lungs, she screamed out, it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Trusted Christ as her Savior because Christ died for her. Y'all got it? You got the word for as it relates to salvation? Y'all got it? I could tell a whole bunch more stories here. Let me one or two and I'll be done. See, it looks to man like God has a problem that he failed. God created man so that man could fellowship with him. And yet, he's a holy God, and his holiness will not tolerate sin, and we're sinners, so there's no fellowship. He's a just God, and his justice demands that every sin be paid. But God didn't fail. God the Trinity had a plan before the foundation of the earth, where God the Son would come to this earth, take upon himself a human body, live a perfect, sinless life, go to the cross of Calvary, and as a result, he would present himself as the substitute for us. His blood would cover our sin and make it possible for us to have fellowship with a holy God. The justice of God would be satisfied because my sins would be paid for. If you'll, if you'll look with me, and in verse 8, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Now, really, this is hinted at all of the Bible. The scene is a great trial in heaven. God, the creator, is the judge. Satan is the accuser, the prosecuting attorney, if you will, and I'm the accused. And this is the accusation of Satan. Phil Stringer is a sinner. I've been accused a few times in my life, every preacher has, of things I did not do, and I just stand confidently and smile and answer, I'm innocent. But now the accusation is that I'm a sinner, and I'm guilty. But the Bible 
tells me there's another person in that scene in the courtroom. I have a defense attorney, Jesus Christ the righteous. And the Bible tells me the handwriting of the ordinances against me were nailed to his cross. Do you know what happens if you nail a sheet of paper to a cross on which a human being is being crucified? The blood would cover the sheet of paper and it would become unreadable, his blood stain. So Satan makes the accusation of my first sin. I don't even know what the first one was. He makes the accusation of my first sin and my defense attorney says, Your Honor, that indictment should not be allowed in this court. You can't read it. No court in the world would accept an indictment that was unreadable. And my defense attorney insists that the indictment against me for my first sin be thrown out. And so it is. Indictment number two, my second sin. I don't know how many there are. I don't want to know how many there are. But my defense attorney says, Your Honor, that's not acceptable in this court because that indictment cannot be read. If you look at that indictment, the only thing you see is blood stain, And you can't make out any of the words. And indictment number two gets thrown out. Guess what? By the time we're done, every single indictment against me has been thrown out because Christ died for me. And I am declared innocent. You say, that's not true, Brother Stringer. It, it's not factually true, but there are in court something called legal truth or legal fiction. Anybody that adopts a little baby gets a birth certificate, says the baby was born to them. I've been with some folks when they got that. It's a precious moment for them to hold that. It says that baby was born to them. It's not true. It's legally true. Are you ready? I have been declared innocent of every accusation against me. You say it's not true. Legally it's true. It's true in God's court. It was Easter this year. I was preaching this message. A man came up to me after the service said, I'd like to talk to you if I could. He said, my life's a mess. It's a disaster. He said, it's Easter, and I thought I should go to church somewhere at Easter. And the pastor of this church, uh, I work at a hardware store, and he came to the hardware store and bought something, and I was working the cash register, and he gave me a tra gospel track and invited me to church. He said, so this morning I was trying to figure out, where, where can I go to church? And I remembered that track. And so I came here. He said, I just came here because I thought you ought to go to church on Easter. He said, I had no idea there was all this. Are you saying my sins could actually be forgiven? John 3.16. Four verses from the book of Romans. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. He trusted Christ as his Savior. Thank God for a pastor that gave out a gospel track. Or two Sundays ago, a lady there she's Filipino she was dating an American man she got him to come to church said he comes to church every Sunday but I cannot get him to trust Christ she said I'm praying for him told me this before the service started I preached this same message went through that and they said told me see he raises his hand every week he'd like to be saved but he never responds he raised his hand the pastor appealed he came forward he said really Christ really died for me and trusted Christ as his savior I go on and on with this so I'll get the idea there's just two things I want you to know Christ died for you if you've not trusted Christ as your savior you ought to trust him this very day the second thing I want you to know is Christ died for everybody around you and it's mine and your job to tell them that Jesus Christ died for them for Christ died for you. Christ died for them. Pastor, would you come take the invitation? My, my. Ain't God good? Song later.